Everyone, please rise to the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everyone. Good evening and welcome to our February Board of Education meeting. With that, I turn it over to Dr. Manning to begin our board recognition program. Thank you. Thank you. It's my pleasure to call Dr. De Lorenzo to the podium for the uh, board recognition program. Yep. Good evening. Okay. <laughs> Good evening. It is with great pride that this evening's board recognition program acknowledges Harborfield students, staff members who have achieved outstanding accomplishments. For our first recognition, we'd like to acknowledge our colleague, Carrie Ann Miller, as the 2021 Elementary Physical Education Teacher of the Year. The Suffolk Zone Chapter of the New York State Association for Health, Physical Education, Recreation and Dance selected Carrie Ann Miller with this tremendous honor. This award is a testament to Carrie Ann's work as an educator. She is a consummate professional, an advocate and role model in every sense of the word. She always goes above and beyond for her students to make sure the lesson is memorable. Congratulations, Carrie Ann. Can you please join us up at the podium? Congratulations. Mr. Franco, can you please join us? For our next recognition, we'd like to acknowledge our high school emerging leaders competition winners. The Young Professionals Chapter of Commerce's 19th Annual Emerging Leaders Business Competition 2021 took place this year on December 1st. Over 300 students participated in this virtual competition from schools all over Long Island. In addition to creating innovative business presentations, students had to present to a panel of judges. Our Harborfield winners were, when you hear your name, can you please come up? Sharon Lynn, second place for graphic design and branding. Alana Tornisi for third place for retail marketing. Madeline Babraccia, third place for retail marketing. Vivian Morgill for third place for not-for-profit not fundraising. Congratulations. Oh, you want to get more? We can. Okay, sure. Next, we'd like to recognize 17 of our Harborfields DECA Club students who competed virtually at the 2021 Suffolk County Regional DECA competition in December. Over 1,000 students from all over Suffolk County participated in various competitions. In addition to preparing and studying for events, students also had to navigate testing and presenting virtually. The winners from Harborfield this year are when you hear your name, can you please come up? 
First place winners, Gavin Crawford for Principles of Finance. Sharon Lynn, first place for Apparel and Accessories and Marketing. Second place winner, Nicole Fibel for Business Service Marketing. Our fourth place winners, Sophia DeMeo for Travel and Tourism Decision-Making Team. Isabella Frangione for Principles of Hospitality and Tourism. Allison Grover for Travel and Tourism Decision-Making Team. Ivy Ann McGill for Business Law and Ethics. At, um, ethic decision making. And Jamie Pisano for business law and ethnic, ethic decision making team. Oh, we have our regional finalists as well. Can we please have Brianna Chavez for personal financial literacy? Victoria Frangione for Principles of Hospitality and Tourism. Charlotte Hasher for Principles of Business Management and Administration. Vaughn Martin for Business Service Marketing. Catherine Poshman for Restaurant and Food Service Management. and Jackson Thomas for entrepreneurship. An honorable, honorable mention, we have Alexa DeBoss for food marketing. Sophia Montelli for principles of finance. And Zoe Zabara Vaughn for principles of marketing. We'd also like to acknowledge our DECA advisor and teacher for her dedication and support in helping her students to achieve great success at the 2021 Suffolk County Regional DECA competition. Congratulations to Dr. Allison Matthews. Congratulations. Our next recognition goes to nine of our high school business students that represented Harbor Fields in the 2021 Adelphi Apprentice Challenge. Students were tasked with designing a marketing campaign for L'Oreal. After a great deal of research and planning, the Harbor Fields team devised a campaign include, including newly environmentally sustainable products, logos, new branding, digital marketing, and public relation and community outreach. Students used technology to create and deliver their presentations. Students collaborated in person using Google Meet and Google Slides to connect and, and present using Adelphi's Zoom platform. Congratulations to our Harborfields team for qualifying as second place finalists. When you hear your name, can you please come up? Sophia DeMeo. Madeline Barbarcia. Nicole Fibel. Nabia Elias. Sharon Lynn. Gabriella Maza. Oh, 
Ivy Ann Margill. Isabella Panzavaccia. And Alana Tornisi. Congratulations. On February 3rd, we hosted the Harborfields Black and the logistics of the night. When they weren't meeting as a committee, members were working hard preparing their students for their performances. Dr. Manning and I were honored to work alongside this committee and we thank them for their hard work in making this such a memorable night. Please join us in welcoming our Black History Celebration Committee, Dan Barrett, Andrea Horowitz, Harmon Kaur, Monique Keith-Golden, Michael Kahn, Lauren Mara, Kathy McNally, Carrie Nira, Jennifer Panisi, Laura Pomerantz, Millie Rivera, Dahlia Romer, Suzanne Legg, Mary Williams, and Jeff Shades, who, we actually, who actually celebrated his 25th year of service to the Black History Celebration Committee. to our Harborfields Art Department for their collaboration with the Black History Celebration Committee. This year, our art department encouraged all students grades K to 12 to, to, to participate and create a work of art that embodied the 2022 Black History Celebration theme, Black Health and Wellness. The winners selected had their work displayed throughout the program and on the official Black History Celebration poster. All artwork submitted was displayed the night of the celebration in the lobby of the high school. We are thankful to the art department for collaborating with the Black History Celebration Committee to make this all happen. Can you please join me in honor, um, celebrating our art department? And can you please join us at the podium when you hear your name? Ms. Beth Devaney, Ms. Laura Rickert, Mr. Drew Lockwood, Ms. Eugenia Ritter, 
Ms. Eileen Rodkamp. Okay, not here. Mr. Carlos Tavares, Ms. Stephanie Buscemi, and yes, oh, Stephanie, there we go. <laughs> and Mr. Chris Moresco. And that concludes our board recognitions for tonight. Thank you. So at this time, it's a pleasure to introduce our student representative for her report, Ms. Anna Gosling. Thank you for joining us, Anna. Thank you. Good evening, Dr. Manning, Board of Education and the Harborfields community. February has been a very exciting month so far at Harborfields. Starting in January on the 22nd of each month, the seniors got their senior surprise from the Senior Parent Task Force. In January, we got a shot of juice from the new juice shop in Juicy in Greenlawn. We got a surprise Valentine's Day for the month of February, and we got a $5 gift card from Deli 51 and a chocolate covered Oreo. Thanks so much to the Senior Parent Task Force for putting this together for us. Everyone loves the surprises so far. Playfest 2022 and the senior superlatives took place at the end of January, and we're all so thankful that they were able to happen despite the snow. All four grades put on amazing performances, and their hard work definitely paid off. Congratulations to our high school students who were part of the scholarship variety show this weekend. Our class presidents for each grade participated in the district-wide cereal box challenge promo video. The Spanish club recently hosted their paint night called Date Night with Dolly last week. It looked like a lot of fun and some great paintings came out of it. Congratulations to our boys swimming, girls winter track, and our bowling teams for making it to counties and to boys basketball for making it to playoffs. Special congratulations to Nigella Trinidad and breaking the school record for shot put with a distance of 39 feet and two inches and for winning the county championship. Sophomore Alex Bronstein received an award for his photography from the Scholastic Art and Writing Awards. Congrats, Alex. Also, Anna Purge, Shannon McQuaid, Kira Saunders, and Owen Sullivan were all chosen to have their art displayed at the Go Ape exhibition at the Art League's building in Dix Hills. The Harborfield's robotics team qualified for the Long Island Championships, and they placed first for the Design Award and third for the Connect Award at their last competition. Our district-wide Black History Month celebration took place earlier this month and featured many of our musicians in the program. Our Interact Club was selling candy grams for Valentine's Day this past week. High school student government is currently running a fundraiser through the month of February called Be the Change to support Huntington Hospital. We are collecting spare change and each grade is holding a fundraiser to donate to the cause. Huntington Hospital has a lot of exhausted emergency staff right now having battled surge after surge. To combat that, we are participating in a fundraiser to support the emergency nurses and doctors. This program directly impacts the psychological well-being of frontline emergency department caregivers at Huntington Hospital. Everyone is looking forward to a nice and relaxing break next week. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. And I know this time of year is a lot of work going on, so you're welcome to stay if you want, and you're welcome to to leave, but thank you so much for being here and your report. Always a hard act to follow. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you and good evening, everyone. Uh, everybody in attendance, those watching at home, I really thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, as Anna indicated in her report, there's so much has happened uh, since our last board meeting. Our students have thrived, continue of course to make us proud every single day. Uh, we held our fourth grade TJL concert in person at the high school and it was the first concert for many of those students and we're so proud that it got to happen and get to see them perform in front of their families. Uh, as Anna said, we also had Playfest, uh, our district-wide Black History Month celebration, PTA variety show, all tremendous performances and very happy that we got those uh, to happen in person. Uh, I want to just give special recognition to our building administrators, a lot of them in attendance. We'll work tirelessly, tirelessly to make that happen. It's not easy uh, in these times to hold off these, uh, these person in-person events, but I have to thank them uh, for all their work. Um, as Anna said, our winter season, sports season, is just a tremendous success. I have to acknowledge Mr. Franco is here, 
as she said, uh, boys swimming program, Suffolk County champions. I think that deserves a round of applause. Um, um, in particular, Alex Zhang, who won his fourth straight county championship, which is amazing. He's gonna be representing Harvard Fields at the state championship uh, when we return for break. So we're really excited for, for Alex and the entire team. Um, Anna shared about Nigella earning the county championship and shot put, that was just tremendous. Uh, a couple of our wrestlers uh, placing, you know, Wyatt LaFountain and Gavin Link Linkvist placing second and fourth respectively in the league. It was tremendous. And she mentioned the boys bowling team qualifying for counties. Really, um, what a successful winter season. I'm really excited to see what the spring will, br will bring. Uh, our cheerleading program is growing and getting better each day. Just recently, they held a youth cheer festival, hosting many young cheerleaders for a fun day of learning and competing. Uh, we're excited about the future direction of our cheer program and really all of our athletic programs. And I wanted to thank and acknowledge our coaches. I know I see a couple of coaches with us um, who provide our students with an incredible fall and winter season. And certainly we're looking forward to spring. Hopefully the weather cooperates uh, for the spring season. Um, as you note on tonight's agenda, we have the second of many budget presentations tonight uh, as we continue that budget development process. I'm looking forward to working alongside the Board of Education as we move through the next several months leading up to the budget, budget vote in May. Uh, we encourage the community to attend all our budget presentations and that will take place uh, each month at our regularly scheduled meetings. Uh, you'll also note on the agenda that the board is considering the adoption of the 22-23 calendar. So that's on the back table for those in attendance. But I will also, uh, upon approval, be sending that out to the community tomorrow uh, for everybody. And I'll post it on our website, of course. Um, another news, I'm proud to share that I uh, joined the Board of Education at a legislative breakfast with Senator Jim Gorin, Assemblyman Keith Brown, Assemblyman Steve Stern. Uh, it was a very productive discussion about advocating for our fair share of state aid, including the full restoration of foundation aid that is included in the uh, recently released executive budget. We also discussed the need to fund mental wellness initiatives for students and the opportunities for Harvard Hill to benefit from legislative grants. In the past, the board has advocated for such grants to fund backup generators at the high school and middle school, and most recently received a grant funding uh, refurbishment of the OMS elevator that's gonna take place soon. Finally, we advocate for our legislators to compel the governor to work with health officials in developing and clearly communicating metrics that we can return to some sense of normalcy in school. We know from comments that the governor has made publicly that the next week or two will be critical in her decision making. I'm just hoping that schools are provided with some advanced warning that allows us to clearly communicate any changes well in advance to our families. I know there are many feelings of frustration on this issue and I just encourage calm and patience as we near the, this next milestone. I'll continue my efforts to communicate with our families on all information as we receive it. Before I get to my superintendent spotlight, I just want to provide a quick COVID update as I do each month. We're thankfully coming down from the 317 cases we had in December and 421 in, in January. As of today, we had approximately 32 cases thus far in the month of February. While those case rates in December and January were, were alarming, I'm as pleased as everyone that that's behind us. And we're doing, I have to thank all of our administrators and our staff uh, for doing everything they need to do to keep students safe and our doors open. Um, I also have to thank our community for their patience, understanding with our efforts to comply with the guidance while making every effort to keep our students safe and in school. I know there's been some confusion with the ever-changing protocols and even with the most recent court rulings. I also know there's a lot of confusion across the state with regard to the court rulings on the 25th. I'm not one to dwell on the past, but I'll say the decisions I make are grounded in the law and the legal guidance we receive. That will be true going forward, and I'm pleased that the board took up this issue as an item for discussion on tonight's agenda. At this point, I'd like to turn to my superintendent spotlight, which is a portion of my report where I have the opportunity to highlight programs at the board and the community in order to raise awareness about the wonderful things that are going on in our schools. Uh, this month, our spotlight focuses on our high school robotics team led by Mr. Michael Pinto. Um, Anna touched on this in her uh, report that our robotics team has been very successful under Mr. Pinto's leadership. And I continue to be so proud of everything they do. On a recent visit to the high school, Dr. DiLorenzo and I got to see an up close look at what it, what it is that they do. From designing and manufacturing their own parts to constructing the robot and even the extensive coding of every movement. It's just an incredible example of real, real world project-based learning at its finest. So Mr. Pinto, I'm gonna turn it over to you and your team. I can't wait to see what, uh, what you have to show us. 
Can we turn that microphone on? Can we turn the podium microphone on? Turn the podium microphone, thank you. We're good, okay. Thank you very much. I'm Mike Pinto, high school science teacher and uh, robotics coach. So this is my robotics team. Um, so I just wanna tell you a little bit about what the high school robotics uh, team does and, and what we compete in. So we compete in the first tech challenge, which is a um, global, global league where we have to compete uh, with a, a small robot has to fit within an 18 by 18 by 18 inch cube. And our field is normally a little bigger, 12 foot by 12 foot, but uh, we have like a mini version of it. So we have two robots up here and we have to build the robot to be, do some autonomous tasks on its own and then also do some driver controlled tasks. So we're gonna show you some of those tonight. Uh, there's a new challenge each year. So every year we have to do, you know, prepare for a different, game that, that comes up. And this year's game, we're going to show you, we have to collect uh, so what we call freight, because the theme for this year is called Freight Frenzy. So we have to collect freight, which are these little yellow cubes. And uh, there's a few other pieces of freight that you can see on the bottom right corner there. And we have to do various tasks with them. So a couple of things I want to show you while we're, uh, while these guys are, are wheeling around with the robot. So You'll, first thing you might notice is the, the motion of the robot. So it's not just four simple wheels. We use what's called mechanum wheels, which are very unique. Um, if you look up at the, at the screen, there's a bunch of rollers set up in a diagonal pattern. And if you have them staggered so that they're pointing in different directions, you can get this robot to go in many different directions. It's omnidirectional. So you can get it to go forwards or backwards, left or right, diagonally. You can get it to rotate, okay? There's many different motions and that makes the, the movement much more efficient. Now it takes a lot of coding and a lot of programming in order to achieve that. So these guys, it's not as simple as just hitting a joystick. It looks like that's what they're doing. It looks like they're playing a video game right now, but it took hours and hours and hours of coding to get those wheels to turn in a proper direction to get the robot to go the direction you want it to go. All right, so you notice the motion first. So they have those mechanum wheels, a lot of coding that goes into that. Speaking of coding, um, these guys write thousands of lines of code in order to get this to work properly. So it's not as simple as just taking a screwdriver and screwing it together and hit and go. They have to actually code it from scratch. So we have a couple of snippets of code up here. Um, this chunk of code that you'll see in the black on the right there, is an interesting piece of code. So one of the tasks is that it has to do some autonomous tasks, tasks on its own in the first 30 seconds of the competition where we just turn a robot on and then it does its own thing. And in the competition, they randomly place these yellow blocks on certain positions on the field. And the robot has to scan and figure out where the block is and properly go and, and pick it up. So there's three possible locations where it could be left, middle, or right. And the robot has what's called computer vision where there's a little camera on it and it can sense how much yellow is it picking up? Is it picking up a lot of yellow, meaning that the block is close, a little bit of yellow or next to no yellow. And that will help it to decide where to go to pick up that yellow block on its own, 100% on its own, autonomously. So that's the chunk of code that they wrote to get the camera to sense this and then tell the robot where to go to pick it up. This next chunk of code, you'll see that the robot is picking up these yellow pieces of freight and then dropping it on the top tier of this thing called the control hub. And we have two and a half minutes to do this as many times as possible to achieve as many points as possible. And so these guys were able to code it so that a simple one button press commands a couple, about six different motors to extend that arm, flip over properly and drop it perfectly on the top level there. So there, this is the code that was written to tell all those different motors to move properly in proper order and everything like that. Open up the hand, drop it properly. So that's what this, this piece of code is. Now this next one actually brings the arm back in. So all of those motors that were extended and this thing extends about six feet out, all those motors that, that were extended, brings them back in properly so that then the robot can zip around and go pick up another block. 
You'll also notice that these have, they have these little silicon flappers that scoop up the block. Um, you get a penalty if you, if you scoop up more than one block. So we custom designed those, those little flappers and they actually custom, they, they poured the silicone themselves and they custom designed custom molds and everything. And so those help to scoop up just one block at a time so we don't get penalized. All right, a um, couple of achievement, achievements that these guys have had. So in, in previous years, uh, we have won qualifying tournaments going to the Long Island Championship the past five years. So we've you know, had a good stretch. Um, you know, we started off with popsicle sticks and AA batteries, and now uh, you know, we're doing some good things. 2018, we went to the Super Regional, which we, we competed against 72 teams uh, from the, the best 72 teams of the East Coast. Last year, we qualified for the World Championship, which is pretty good. It was canceled due to COVID, but, you know, we did pretty good leading up to it. Now, this year, these guys are doing great this year. So we've done two qualifiers, one in January, one in February. They got first place design award for each qualifier. So, that you know, the, the judges really like their design of the, of the robot. They got third place Inspire Award, which is like an all-around good team award. Uh, control awards for their, for their coding and programming. In this February qualifier, there was second place top point scorer and very successful year fundraising. So, you know, th this stuff isn't cheap and we have to reach out to local companies, local businesses and, uh, and, and sponsors to try and support us. And so they've had a very successful year of fundraising. And also we've uh, worked with the OMS Robotics Club a little bit to train some of the younger, you know, younger ones coming up. And we are planning uh, for a code night with uh, Washington Drive. So. You know, it's a pretty successful year. And you can see uh, the robot's been busy at work while I've been talking this whole time. Wait. Uh, oh, I forgot the most important part. March 12th, they are competing in the Long Island Championship. So wish them luck. Uh, quick little thank you for the support. So we wouldn't be able to really do this uh, without a lot of support. So all of these businesses have helped us out year after year after year. Um, you know, with some donations to help fund the program and everything. HACEF has always supported us every year. Um, they've always helped us out. The PTA too, okay? They've always been chipping in to, to help get us started each year. A lot of community members. We had, um, you know, a pretty significant donation from a random community member. Just heard we were doing good things and, and um, you know, gave a little donation. The custodial staff at the high school always deals with... Um, you know, setting up tools for us and cleaning up after us. The technology staff has helped us out with a lot of the, the computer systems and the, uh, and the coding. The administration have always been helpful and supportive, um, you know, busing, things like that. And uh, Board of Ed, of course. And also, uh, last but not least, the parents of these guys, because they pick them up late from school, drive them to weekend competitions, and, uh, you know, Parents have been the most supportive. So that's all we have. We could, they, they'll stay all night if you want. Um, you know, they're having a lot of fun. But uh, that's it. These guys are great. So thank you. Guys, we thank you so much for, uh, thank you so much for being here. Thank Mr. Pinto, great presentation. I'm sorry. Thank you so much, Mr. Pinto, for your presentation, and thank you to the team for setting up. I know it wasn't easy bringing everything over here, but we greatly appreciate it. I like to say I understood anything about that code, but I didn't. But I understood what you was, you were trying to do, and it's incredible. So that's just an example of some of the real world learning opportunities we're, we're looking to expand on and bring to, to all of our students. And uh, we're just so proud of the work. So again, thank you, Mr. Pinto. And that does conclude my report. So thank you so much. And uh, I do wanna end by wishing everybody a very peaceful and relaxing uh, midwinter recess. Oh, so now I'll turn it over to uh, Mrs. Donnelly, who's gonna lead a, a couple of presentations. The first one is our capital uh, update on our capital projects as the community is aware. We're in the uh, just wrapping up phase two of a three phase uh, capital project. Uh, so Mrs. Donnelly, it's all yours. Thank you, Dr. Manning. Good evening. Uh, the way that this presentation is set up is to list the projects that were done under phase one. 
and it, because the previous presentation went into detail for those showing pictures. So that's the last presentation that happened. This presentation then will list the projects that occurred in phase two with pictures for those, because that's really what this update is about. Um, it'll go building by building. And then at the very end, there'll be a list of what's yet to come in the summer of 22 under phase three. So at the high school uh, under phase one, there's a new security vestibule and there's a transaction window at the entrance. Um, there were some doors that were fully replaced. And of course there was the turf field that was installed. Uh, the phase two projects that were just completed uh, were a new security vestibule at the main entrance, the library renovation, which is extremely exciting, uh, select bathroom renovations, and heating and ventilation upgrades. This is the security vestibule showing the transaction window at the entrance of the high school. Here's the gorgeous library. You can see that it is just an amazingly vibrant space. Uh, bathroom renovations. Oops, sorry. And the gymnasium was air conditioned, which is also wonderful. At the middle school, we had new security hardware added to all of the interior doors and some doors uh, were full, fully replaced under phase one. Under phase two, we have the security vestibule, which you see uh, we have run into some supply chain issues. So that has been slowed a little bit, but now we'll be receiving the storefront, which is the second set of doors. That's called the storefront, the interior doors, and the vestibule itself can be completed once we, we get those items and the floor will be refinished so that it looks beautiful and there will be column covers. So we're, we're finally seeing the light for those um, supplies to come in so that that work here can be finished. Of course, uh, the lobby area, as just discussed, was renovated, is being renovated. A new ADA compliant fire and smoke detection system was installed. The gymnasium was air conditioned. Uh, there were ventilation improvements for third floor corridors and select classrooms. And another gorgeous library renovation took place here. This is a picture of what's right outside the door here, um, showing you just one of the pull stations for the new fire smoke detection system. The gym was air conditioned. And here again, we just see a gorgeous library. You know, it used to, it used to really look like a hallway because it was a pass through between the two sides of the building. And just that this was designed so beautifully, you can see to the left of this picture, now the pathway is off to the side, just drawing the children through and making them a part of things, even as they just pass through, it's just an amazing space. Who, what, what child wouldn't just love to be in this space? All the adults love it. I know we're just amazed by it. Wonderful transformation. Librarians very excited too, as you can imagine, all of the librarians. Uh, moving on to TJL, uh, their phase one project included security hardware for all of their interior doors. And they also enjoyed having their library renovated under phase two. Um, they have a gorgeous science room that was made out of classroom B1. Their gymnasium was likewise air conditioned and they had ventilation improvements as well. So here you see the TJL gorgeous library. That's a huge transformation from what used to be there. It's just wonderful. You can see there's all kinds of seating options in each library, bright colors. 
here's uh, the classroom, the science classroom. People go in there and they're just like, oh my gosh, it's just awesome. Here's the opposite view of that science classroom. And the gym was air conditioned there as well. At Washington Drive, their phase one projects included the security vestibule enhancement and a transaction window was installed there as well, just like at the high school. Um, under phase two, they had carbon monoxide detection um, installed per new code. They have a beautiful sports area in, in the back near the playground. They had exhaust system upgrades in the second floor corridors and the gymnasium was air conditioned. So it's air conditioning at all four schools in the gymnasiums. Here's a picture of the sport court. Their gymnasium. Um, at the high school for the summer, this coming summer, we're gearing up for phase three. The NPR room, the multi-purpose room will be renovated. Uh, the South Gym will likewise be renovated. There'll be exhaust fan upgrades in the building and there'll be various um, exterior masonry repairs. At the middle schools, there'll be drainage upgrades in the area where the buses pull up and park, exhaust fan upgrades. There'll be a new storage unit, exterior masonry repairs here as well, and ductwork repairs in the cupola and the east attic. At TJL, they will have a facelift to their front entrance. That is really going to be exciting and will be a huge change. Perimeter fencing upgrades and masonry repairs there as well to the exterior. At Washington Drive, there'll be drainage upgrades at the rear canopy, sidewalk repairs. They'll have an exterior storage unit placed there as well. And the stairwell settlement by room E6 will be addressed and corrected. So a lot of really good stuff coming after a lot of planning, hard work, overcoming obstacles. It's really, uh, this is the exciting part for sure. Okay, so now- Thank you, Thank oh, you so much, Ms. Donnelly. I don't wanna give an opportunity if the board wants to comment or ask oh, questions on surely. the capital bond project. Does anyone on the board have any? Questions for Sharon? No questions, but I just uh, I just want to comment on uh, the progress that we're making with these projects. Uh, it, it's been a long time coming. Um, this has been a lot of work over the past few years, and I just you know want to just express my appreciation to, to, to the central office for the work we've done in managing these projects and seeing them to, to this point. Uh, it's fantastic. Uh, the libraries alone are uh, it's just great to see them. You can imagine the kids there and the impact it must be having on them. Um, you know, in the schools. So just thank you for the, for the great work. And, uh, you know, we do look forward to, you know, completing the rest of these projects uh, in the near future. So thanks again. Thank you too, for your support with everything. Can I, I, I just wanna echo Dave's thoughts. Thank you. This, this is like uh, front page news stuff in a normal year. This is fantastic. Um, I was in the libraries, TGL library the other day and um, OMS last week. It's, it's stunning. Um, hopefully the kids are, they're in there now, right? Yep. Walking through it. Hopefully they're enjoying it. Uh, I'm really looking forward to TJL entrance next year. Um, un unbelievable work. And it's, uh, it's just happening behind the scenes, very seamless. So thank you. Thank you. Awesome. It's hard to contain the excitement. <laughs> and we hope to uh, potentially uh, have opportunities for uh, parents to come see some of the renovations um, this summer, mm -hmm. especially um, for parents who are in different buildings, just to kind of take a look at what's ahead for their children in the uh, upper grades. Yeah. So thank you. And um, with that, we'll move on to our budget presentation. Our vision and mission statements here. Um, this is just an outline of this presentation. There's a budget mission besides the mission for the district. There's a budget mission, budget goals. We'll go through the budget development process, where we are today with the budget, and then the timeline for the budget. 
So the 22-23 budget will be developed to support the district's current and long-term goals and to strengthen the district's instructional program services in an innovative and collaborative learning environment. Our budget goals include the strategic allocation of available resources and funding to maintain and enhance programs and services, and to continue to support the budget with prudent use of reserves. So the budget process starts really in November, where the board and the central office team talk about the budget parameters, a vision for the budget, developing initiatives and the like, and getting information to the budget builders who are the administrators, who are the principals in each building and the department administrators as well. And then they create their budgets for the upcoming year based on the needs in their building or department, looking back at what they've done in the past from the information we give them. Enrollment is analyzed in December and the working budget platform is created into which we absorb all of the pieces that we get from the budget builders to put into the budget draft itself. In January, um, January 18th this year, uh, we receive the governor's proposed budget and we start digging into it and analyzing it and refining some of the numbers because we have information that we can fine tune the information that the governor has based on where we are with our debt service, our building aid and um, fine tuning some of the other aids that come in. The CPAI value, the consumer price index value, it was finalized and released. This year it was 4.7%. And we meet with, uh, central office meets with the building administrators and the department administrators to go over their budgets. And then we had our first presentation to the board, the first budget presentation to the board in January. In February, we, we continue refining and analyzing the state aid revenues. Uh, we prepare the tax levy draft uh, following the controller's formula, on, uh, which is on the New York State Controller's website. All New York State schools have to follow this formula. And that's how the tax levy limit number is derived, also known as the cap. We'll discuss that in greater detail at next month's meeting. We analyze our reserves and we start to look at projecting what we think we will need for the 22-23 budget for our existing contracts, for health insurance, for utilities, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the board receives a formal draft um, this month for their review. And we have our second presentation right now. That's what this is. In March, every school district has to uh, report online what its tax levy limit will be uh, by March 1st to the state controller's office. We, uh, the board gives comments to administration regarding the budget. And we have our third budget presentation. Uh, in April, the, the deadline is April 1st um, for the governor and legislature to agree on a state budget and finalize our state aid numbers. The Board of Education will adopt a proposed budget and the property tax report card in April. And there are budget discussions throughout the district and the fourth budget presentation. In May, we have our budget hearing on May 10th. On May 11th, this what's called the six day notice, which has key budget information gets mailed out to residents' homes. And the culmination of all of this is the budget vote and the annual um, district uh, board election, May 17th. That's a statewide date as well. So what's the status of the budget today? 
Um, this section, I will go over these subtitles in this section, uh, components of the budget, general composition of revenues, what comprises the non-tax levy revenues. We'll briefly touch on the tax levy draft, um, and then a summary of all revenues for the revenue budget and a year-to-year -year budget comparison. So uh, these are the components of the budget. The, the revenue side of the budget and the expenditure side of the budget sort of interplay with each other and are really dictating each other in a way um, because your expenditures are limited by your available revenues and your revenues will also drive what your, your expenditures are in that way. The revenues are comprised of the tax levy, uh, miscellaneous revenue, which is like interest and any building use sort of revenue that comes in, um, state aid, of course, and Harbor Fields always appropriates fund balance and reserves to uh, support the budget as well. The expenditures are primarily comprised of salaries and benefits, contractual services, as well as other things like utility supplies and the like. Uh, the general composition of revenues. So state aid um, is about 19% of the annual budget this year, um, of the revenue budget that is. 4% of the annual budget is coming from other revenues like fund balance, reserves, miscellaneous revenue. And then the tax levy, which are the funds obtained from residents comprises approximately 77% of the budget. This is what the non-tax levy revenues looked like probably you know, a week and a half ago. So these numbers are changing a little bit as we continue to take a deep dive and deep analysis of the budget, especially digging in this month in February. Um, we're looking at, at that time of appropriating fund balance of $2,050,000 using designated reserves and a reduction in non-spendable advance that total about 896,000. That reduction in non-spendable advance is something that we haven't seen before. It is another kind of a reserve. It's been set aside in fund balance at the end of last year to cover the shortfall in the school lunch fund. So it's already in there, it's already set aside as of last year and here we are applying it to the very purpose it's designated for. And that happens via a transfer to the school lunch fund. Miscellaneous revenue of about $800,000 and state aid right now based on that January um, run that we have from the governor's proposal, it's just a proposal of 17.7 .7 million, totaling about $21.5 million of non-tax levy revenue. So the allowable tax levy draft is, um, it's going through the formula that every district in the state has to follow from the controller's website. Although it's the same formula, every district has different numbers that go into it. So the tax levy cap for a particular district is just for that particular district based on their finances, their debt, their building aid. Um, and it begins, of course, with what their levy was last year as the starting point. It's also based on the consumer price index and certain exclusions. Exclusions meaning certain things that are not subject to that consumer price limit, also known as the 2% limit. That's why you don't see the tax levy cap coming in at 2%. You know, a lot of people think that that's what the, it, it if there's a 2% cap, that means that your tax levy limit, every tax levy limit for every district can exceed 2%. No, there's just a part of the calculation. Again, I'll go over that in greater detail and you'll see what I mean next month where that 2% hits, but then there are certain things that are excluded from that 2% so that the district can meet its obligations to pay its debt service. Anyway, that's a little aside. 
Um, at this point in time, the allowable tax levy has been calculated to be 2.28%. So that's 2.28% in a year when the CPI was 4.7. So that, that's a little difficult. Oh, and here's, I just gave away the slide. So you see the consumer price index at 4.7% is not equal to what the allowable tax levy limit is. Again, it's because there are certain things that are excluded from the calculation. Here's a summary of all revenues as of about two weeks ago. Um, Non-tax levy revenues of that 21 and approximately a half million dollars that were detailed on a previous slide. Non, uh, I'm sorry, then tax levy revenue at the 2.28% per our first draft of the levy limit, which is approximately, approximately $70.6 million, which brings us to what we like to call the allowable tax levy budget total, what's available of approximately $92 million. Now we've been doing a lot of analysis of the numbers, uh, we do what we call a variance analysis. We look at last year's budgeted number for every single line item. There's like 900 line items in our budget, um, which you can see last year's online. Um, and we go line by line and we examine what the changes were and we start to refine the numbers. Uh, maybe we need to budget more in an account because we think, you know what, gas prices are likely to go up, things like that. So we're, we're about uh, at 92.4 million at this point, but still finalizing. So here you can see uh, last year's budget was $90.3 million. Uh, this year's um, amount shown here on the slide is about 92.1. Um, so we have a difference here of about 1.7, 1.8 million. Subject to change because we don't have the state um, aid finalized yet. And we are, like I just explained, going through the budget line by line and making revisions. Uh, this next section talks about the budget timeline. We had our first presentation in January. Here we are doing presentation number two. The next presentation will take that deep dive into the line by line um, tax levy calculation in March. And then in April is our fourth presentation. Our fifth presentation and budget hearing take place on Tuesday, May 10th. And then uh, the culmination of all this work is uh, in preparation for the budget vote on Tuesday, May 17th. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Ms. Donnelly. Um, does anyone on the board have any uh, questions or comments about the budget at this time? Uh, Sharon, just a quick question. The, the um, I just jotted it down quickly. The, the March 1st tax calculation that you submit to the state, what, um, you just um, add a little color to it. What, what is that? And um, it's, can you hear me? Can you guys hear me now? Okay, thank you. So that is going through the calculation that is shown on the New York State Comptroller's website, which I'll do line by line in March's presentation. It's starting out with last year's tax levy. There's um, adjustments that are made to that for the tax base growth factor, which is you know whatever brick and mortar additions happened right. in the district. But, so is that you know, all like preliminary no, numbers or? Well, we see that the draft number is yeah. 2.28. Um, probably so, won't change. Oh, okay. I could though. We do submit the draft number by March 1st and we are allowed to revise okay. after, should that be necessary. 
Okay. But we have to just submit by March 1st. Anyone else? Yeah, Ms. Dolly. So thank you for um, for the presentation um, and and making mention of the um, two percent tax levy and how that this where we stand right now. Our allowable levy now as it stands is at two point two eight percent, right? Which on first glance might say, well, it, it looks like it's above that two percent tax levy, but yet that's the name of the law and not how the law actually functions. Correct? Absolutely correct. Okay, so where we are, two point two eight would still require just a fifty percent vote on a, on a budget. We we are not proposing any kind of uh, over to over an allowable cap, correct? True. That's within the tax levy cap limit. Two point eight percent is within it, not piercing. That's what we are allowed to um, have our our tax be um, while staying within the limit. Okay. No, I appreciate it. I know you said you're going to go into more detail in the next presentation. So mm -hmm. thank you. Appreciate that. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we're going to move on to our first public participation. For those of you who may um, be joining us for the first time, we um, you, you needed to register with the district clerk who will call you up in the order um, that it was received. We just ask that you restate your name um, into the microphone. We allow everyone three minutes um, to speak. We have a counter in front of you to help aid you um, in your timing of your comment. Um, this is an opportunity for the public to comment and for the Board of Education um, to, to listen. And we request that nobody um, discuss individual members of our community or students or any specific student issue that needs to be addressed with the administration separately. Shane Mel, Shane Mel, okay. Sandra Coleman. Hi, I'm a mother of three, two in Harbor Fields. And I wanted to speak tonight because I wanted to know what happened on Tuesday, January 25th, 2022. The ruling by Judge Rodmaker found Hochul's mask mandate unconstitutional. So that allowed the kids to go to mask optional. We emailed and called Dr. Manning and the Board of Education. We even called the district attorneys who we were told said that there was a stay in place. Other school districts at the that they represent by our law firm were going mask optional. Other school districts that our Board of Education either work at or their kids go to other school districts, they went mask optional. So how did Harborfields not know? We have a highly paid superintendent and Board of Education members that ran to be elected. So what was the discrepancy or the confusion we wrote the Board of Education and Dr. Manning advising that the attorney who brought the suit against the state of New York said no stay was in place. We sent it to him. So now Dr. Manning says that he made the decision on his own and didn't speak to the board at all that day. So that questions, why didn't they care enough to call Dr. Manning and say, what's going on? I know other school districts that will mask optional. Why aren't we? So Massless Tuesday was enjoyed by many school districts throughout Long Island. It was a great success. The kids loved it and there was no super spreader. I have numbers for about 20 different school districts and all their numbers were low. Some were even zero. That's why it was, wasn't all over the news because it was a success. Nobody got sick and made um, a big super spreader out of this. So why can't they go maskless now? Why can't we have parent choice? So for two years, the kids have been wearing masks. The CDC just recently said that it's, that they're useless. So if Johnny wearing a mask sat next to Becky wearing a mask, it was like they weren't wearing one, but they were. The box itself on the mask says it does not stop the spread of COVID-19. It also says only good for four hours. 
So what are the kids doing the other four hours? Wearing masks that don't work, like they were doing the first four hours. So other school districts, again, are writing letters to stop the mask mandate. I ask that you do this too, and let it be a parent choice. It's been two years, enough is enough. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Coleman. Shane Mill. Hi, my name is Shane Mel, and I'm in fifth grade. I have spoken to you before. Nothing has changed since I spoke to you last year. Masks don't work. They hurt. My glasses fog up. I'm out of breath during gym, and I can't see my teachers or friends smile. But I can go to Dunkin' Donuts without a mask, Starbucks without a mask, and restaurants without a mask. And I need to wear one in school? That doesn't make any sense. Today, my class had outdoor recess, and we couldn't use any equipment outside, and we had to stay social distance. That's pretty much a waste of time. My dad, who was on the full day kindergarten committee, now regrets hoping to make it a full day because those little kids have to wear a mask for seven hours. How do they learn when they can't even see faces? Please, and I mean please, listen and change things. I used to look forward to the first day of school, but now I'm looking forward to the last. Thank you, Shane. Scott Coleman. I'd like to request that we get a podium up here for the speakers. Can we do that? Moving forward. You guys have a table, you've got a podium. I think we're more comfortable. So I sent you all an email on 129. Sent to the board, sent to you, Manning. It said, it, copy and paste from New York State School Board Association, model code of ethics for members, respect for stakeholders, which includes students, parents, and the community. Best practices, communicate and interact with district stakeholders. That's us. Here's your time to do that. Off of your Board of Education Policy Manual, 310-E, Board Self-Evaluation, an exhibit, Standard 3, Communication and Community Relations. B, the board establishes effective communication with parents, students, staff, and community members. 1,000, Community Relations Goals. The Board of Education strives to construct, conduct district affairs by way of continuing open dialogue with the community, I expect to get that open dialogue tonight with the question I have for you now. Why are we wearing masks here tonight? Mr. Coleman, the Board of Education, as you see on the agenda, will be having a discussion about masks. This is about masks. This is part of the agenda. Why are we wearing masks tonight? What? What? It, it, your manual says open dialogue with the community. Where's the open dialogue? Did anyone return my email? Did you all get my email? I know you did. Did anyone return my email? No. Mr. Coleman. Why are we wearing masks tonight? Mr. Coleman, I'll just say that uh, you, Mrs. Coleman asked me that same question I answered her in writing. So what's the answer? I sent it to her in writing. All right. I can send, right. I can send for everyone else here, for everyone else here, for the community, dialogue with the community. Why are we wearing masks tonight? You have it in writing. It's part of the Okay. Commission, the other night we had a variety show. Masks were optional on stage. You all tweeted photos of students and staff without masks. Why are we mas wearing masks tonight? I'm not going to get into Why that. was my daughter, she had to be masked up for her play? But my family came in to see the play. We didn't have a mask. No one said boo. Uh, that's not true. I was there. Oh, I could. We took photos. Okay. We took photos, video. Okay. Okay. So you're afraid of losing the EP ESSER funds. Is that correct? Is that correct? We're afraid of losing funds. What's the worst can happen if you said, you know what, Kathy Hochul, 
your mandate or so-called mandate is crap. We're not following it. Our kids have the option. What's the worst that could happen? Anybody? All right. Call me time Mr. Up. Coleman, thank you. Time is up. No answer? I'll, I'll get back to you tomorrow. I'll talk to you tomorrow. All right. Okay, Mr. Coleman, thank you. Your time is up. Oh, Jenny Zedner. Hi, good evening. My name is Jenny Zethner. I'm a pediatric nurse practitioner. I have three children, uh, one still in the district. Um, I was going to send an email, but I'd really rather speak to the community, to whoever. be a time where they're going to say the numbers are good and they're going to come down. But unfortunately, New York State Department of Health has regulations that they're going to pass. We're going to find out next week or this week that the New York State Department of Health regulations will go into effect and they will read as follows. I'll read exactly from the regulations. Um, these regulations provide that masking may be required under cert certain circumstances as determined by the commissioner of health based on COVID-19 incidents and prevalence, as well as any other public health and or clinical risk factors related to COVID disease spread. Essentially what that means for every parent that is listening, we can all celebrate when the masks come off in the spring because inevitably the disease, the numbers will go down. But around holidays uh, is when school starts, when we see numbers going back up, the Department of Health will now in New York State just have the right to say to us, okay, tomorrow mask back on everybody. Uh, <laughs> This makes no sense, right? We've said it repeatedly over and over. We're wearing cloth masks. We've had them in cloth masks. They don't do anything. Kids aren't getting sick with this disease as significantly as the news is stating. They're not super spreaders. We're asking the schools to continue to advocate because we have a system here in New York State that's not advocating for our kids. These regulations are going to go into effect and people aren't going to even know about them until we're told in September, probably masks back on our kids. Additionally, I, I said at the last Board of Ed meeting, New York State uh, Regents voted yesterday or the day before to allow nurses um, to give vaccines in schools. Um, this is unprecedented. Nurses um, haven't been given that um, authority to give vaccines in school. And they're moving this forward through the New York State Department of Education in order to get kids vaccinated, you know, and, you know, and for nurses to be able to give vaccines across, you know, to make it more accessible. Parents should know that this is going to go into effect. Chances are we're just going to hear about it again. These aren't laws that are voted on. This is just, um, you know, regulations that are put into place by the New York State Education Department and by the Department of Health. If any of you want to reach out to me, myself and others have a lot of information, I am more than happy to talk to you to give you information. You probably don't want to reach out to me while you're here because your colleagues, you may feel coerced or uncomfortable, but um, I'm very accessible. I work at the Northport Wellness Center. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Ms. Zephner. Now we're going to move on to our regular board meeting. Um, item three, Board of Education minutes. Um, this is not an actionable item. I'm sorry. Um, the other people have registered for the second public participation. We just concluded our first public participation. Um, item uh, 3.1, Board of Education minutes. Does anyone have any uh, corrections to that? Moving on to finance, 4.1, treasurer's report. Any discussion? 
All in favor? Aye. Item 4.2, schedule of bills. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Item 4.3, financial status report. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Item 4.4, .4, claims auditor's report. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Item 4.5, surplus materials. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Item 4.6, acceptance of gift. Any discussion? Agreed. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Item 4.7, amendment for school services specialized education agreement. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Item 4.8, health care service agreement. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Item 4.9, health services agreements. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Item 4.10, approval of change order. So Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Item 4.11, revision to the Harborfield Central School District Independent Auditor's Report and Financial Statements for the fiscal year ending June 30th, 2021. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Item 4.12, acceptance of gift grants and increase in appropriations. So Second. Any discussion? Okay. Right. Um, thank you, Mr. Kelly, for your um, donation through Bank of America. And I would also just like to thank HACIF, who is continuously generous to the school district, and we would not be able to have all these enhancements without them and their support. And hopefully all of you will support them as well. All in favor? Aye. Aye. 4.13, budgetary transfer of funds. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Item 5.1, resignations. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Item 5.2, leave of absence. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Item 5.3, revision of leave of absence. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Item 5.4, permanent appointment. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Item 5.5, professional appointment. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Item 5.6, professional appointments, teaching assistance. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. 5.7, increase in hours. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Item 5.8, civil service appointments. Dr. Manning. Yep. So I just want to um, announce and welcome Mr. John Moran. John, give a, give a little wave. John is joining the district as the director of facilities. Let's give him a round of applause. John is a, a currently a director of facilities in another district, and we were happy to uh, steal him away. And uh, John, we welcome you to the what we call the Harborfield family. And uh, you know, thank you for the long journey you've been on through the interview process. And uh, we look forward to you know working alongside you and putting all those projects together that you just saw and beautifying the district and, and everything else. So welcome. All in favor? Aye. 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 On behalf of the board, welcome to the team. Item 5.9, transition services. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Item 5.10, civil service change of status. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Item 5.11, abolishment of civil service position. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Item 5.12, creation of civil service position. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Item 5.13, revision of home instructors list. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Item 5.14, substitute list addendum. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 
5.15 separation payments. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Item 5.16, appointment of chairperson for annual, annual budget vote and election. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Item 5.17, extra compensation report schedule. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Moving on to instruction, review of IEP recommendations and authorization for placements and services. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Item 6.2, adoption of the 2022-2023 school calendar. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. And Dr. Manning, as he stated earlier, will be sending the calendar out to the community tomorrow. Next, we'll move on to the second um, public participation. Um, I, no need for me to repeat um, what the uh, protocols are. Susan Palmich. I'd like to thank you for this opportunity. Um, I think I'm probably the oldest person here, and I will tell you um, that I am a lifelong resident of this area. Uh, I was here before this school was built and in the first graduating class from this building as well. Uh, so my name is Susan and I've been in this area all my life. And I was a student at Washington Drive, transferred to the new school on Little Plains, which at that time was the B word, it was busing. I was first graduating class from this building and a graduate of Harborfields High School. And um, I was a varsity cheerleader and we took second in the county. Um, I, I would probably die if I tried to do it today. Um, I have had children and grandchildren come through this district and surrounding districts. I've seen many changes over the years that have not always been in the student's best interest. However, I have never witnessed what I have seen, the blatant disregard for the well being of the children are not being prioritized. Um, there's been a disregard for their well being. And I've never seen anything like this in all the years I've been here. And I've seen a lot in this district. The children have no voice. So tonight I came here to be their voice. Today, I'm presenting myself to you, not just as Susan, as a resident and a student. I'm a clinical social worker, stone's throw from this building. And I will tell you what I've been seeing in my practice and pay attention because you can address this now or later, it's getting worse. emotional, psychological, and developmental, not to mention the educational delays imposed on them is a disgrace. I've witnessed this in my practice, and I've witnessed it personally too, in my family and friends. They cannot be in a mask eight hours a day, and they cannot wait for adults to stop politicizing a medical issue. The administration and teachers can stay in masks if they feel safer that way. But I'm asking you to please give their kids, our kids back their life and their education and let them enjoy themselves. <clears throat> you also can have a mission statement that says that this district has no tolerance for bullying when for the most part, you turn a blind eye to where it occurs, the bus. This district has enough money to have aides on the buses to help in this matter. Where are they? Make the kids the priority. Fix what has harmed them. Excuse me, you can do this Thank now you. or later. Out. I'll be two seconds. Just ask the other mental health and the professionals in the area and the substance abuse counselors we will give you the feedback that you need to help all of your students. Thank you. Thank you.
Linda Marie. Excuse me, we're not going to we're not going to be having um, an interjecting like that, please. Oh, excuse me. This is not acceptable. If you would like the opportunity for everyone to speak, you have to be respectful for the speaker and we listen. So if you don't want to comply and you're going to have a, a, a fight, then we're not going to continue. OK, we're, not, we're going to we can take that offline, but we're not going to have that out in public. I am Linda. I took business in school and I was a member of the Deco Club. I was very proud to see all the students and the awards that they won. I went to school in the town of Islip, Sachem, which is the biggest suburban high school in the whole country. My parents want wanted us to move and my mother went to college in the 70s and got a job full time. I basically homeschooled myself. I was a latchkey kid and I went to Comac and I've been living in the township of Huntington on and off for the last 30 plus years. I am also anti-mask for the children, because the children are our future. They're everyone's future. And I'm anti-mask for everyone, okay? I also have COPD, so it's very difficult for me. Uh, and I also wear glasses also, so I understand those problems. Now today, I wanna call it a poem, but it's a prayer. And I feel that it's very um, pertinent with what we're speaking about here today. It's from the Sisters of Charity in Baltic, Connecticut. as a section of prayers for special persons and needs. I am going to read to you prayer for the students. I'm going to change it from first person to third person. God of light and truth, thank you for giving us a mind that can know and a heart that can love. Help us to keep learning every day of our lives for all the knowledge can lead us to you. Lead us to be aware of your presence in all things and at all times. Encourage us when our studies are difficult and when I am when we are tempted to give up give us confidence when our brains seem slow to understand and the way forward is filled with struggles and challenges grant us the grace to fully express all the talents and gifts you have entrusted to us to explore the world you have created, certain that in your love and goodness, all will be well in our lives according to your divine plan. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Ryan Shi. Last August, when everyone was still in the compliance will lead to the end mode, many thought I was insane for standing up here and arguing that schools should drop the mask mandate. Evidently, the common sense facts weren't enough for people, just to name a few. Kids face the least risk from COVID of all age groups. Transmission and infection rates in schools are scraping the floor. And the mask mandate is dropped everywhere in New York State besides in schools. As I say, common sense is not common. And this is a perfect example. However, after the Nassau County Supreme Court ruling, 
multiple appeals, this district breaking the law and all of it being highly publicized, many have had their eyes opened. Everyone in this room should agree that our district administration is infiltrated with a biased, self-interested, monetarily motivated and reputationally compromised ind individual whose last priority is admirably representing the students that they were elected to represent. If you don't see that clearly occurring, you're either in denial or grossly misinformed on the matter. Other individuals have proven to be less than trustworthy and made some interesting decisions based on the knowledge that they had. School districts that our administrators have personal connections with were mask optional on January 25th. The law firm that represents Harborfields represents several districts that were mask optional on January 25th as well. Harborfields illegally enforced the mask mandate on January 25th. They knew exactly what was going on and they knew they broke the law. When they realized that they screwed up, they sent multiple confusing emails basically saying, it wasn't us, but it was us, but it wasn't us. With the intent, at least I believe, to keep anyone from actually understanding what was going on and to cover their own incompetence. To say that there's a true disconnect and disregard in our administration would be an understatement. A disconnect and disregard between our administration and community, administration and neighboring school districts, and administration and the law. Even if by some miracle the school mandate is dropped in the near, the near future, the clear corruption that commands the actions of this administration must be called out because there are still way too many people oblivious to the matter. My goal, as I've said before, isn't to make you like me. I'm here to give you the truth pill, which is a tough one to swallow, but a necessary one to get. This isn't a personal attack, so don't take it that way. I'm just calling it as I see it, which not enough people do these days. If you don't like it, I'm sorry. To say that this whole situation isn't fair wouldn't come close to properly describing it. And there aren't, just wor there aren't words that can describe it. It's not fair that our community has to battle you guys as fiercely as we do every day. You should be the ones fighting against the people above you for us, not the other way around. It's not fair that your students and their families can't be afforded the most basic right to make a personal medical decision. Lastly, it's not fair that a student has to be the one standing up here calling out a bunch of adults, and you should all be embarrassed that this is what it's come to. I would much, I would much rather be at baseball practice right now, which is going on in the high school gym as we speak, but I feel obligated to be here instead. That should tell you something. The past month, and truthfully, the past two years, have shown exactly why you should always question those who create and enforce policy that doesn't seem quite right, because you may very well end up exactly where we are now. Scott Coleman. So I brought this up last meeting too, nothing has happened. December 13th, an article in Huntington Now. Board member claimed that he was abused and accosted. Mr. Coleman, what? you know you had a response from Dr. Manning. We cannot discuss I don't have any, a response. We, do, we cannot discuss any investigations. It is a confidential what? matter. Wait, 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 wait. This happened in October. Where's the investigation? Mr. Coleman, you are not privy to that kind of information. I'm sorry. And I know that what? Dr. And I know that Dr. Manning has already communicated that to you. We will not be discussing an individual person nor an individual I investigation. I didn't say any names. Doesn't matter. I just want to know there's racial discrimination in this room, right? That's what we're told. Someone has claimed that they were racially accosted after a meeting and that they had security take them to his, that person's car. What do we know about this? Once again, I'm going to just repeat to you that you are not privy to that investigation. When is this investigation going to wrap up? You will not be privy to that information. Thank you for your comment. Five months now, it's going on. Was the accusation made up? Mr. Coleman, I'm going to ask you if you wanted to, if you want to discuss something else, you can pick a different topic for the rest of your time, but we will not be discussing that. You know what? We'll leave it, but shouldn't make accusations. Okay, Mr. Coleman, you are out of line and you will How not- am I out of line? You may not have a conversation with an individual member I'm of the board. I'm not talking to here. an individual. Okay. The whole board. I sent the email to the whole board. Okay. So no one has anything to say about it. I'll go back to when I was up here before. 
communication with community. And you guys sit there and you say nothing. Anybody? You guys are a disgrace. David Bellastrary. I just want to, on January 25th, my son was not permitted to go to class, okay? He was denied an education. I was quoted for that. Dr. Mang did not like the quote that I made, but it's true. He was sent to the principal's office that day, and I picked him up, okay? Because was, I wasn't going to let him stay in the principal's office like he was punished because he wasn't wearing a mask when he had every right not to. Okay. Two high school basketball players died of cardiac arrest suddenly on the same day without any causative factors. That is a one in 40 billion chance. That's what happened on February 8th. Two teenage basketball players died of heart attacks on the court. 649 athlete collapses with 404 sudden deaths over the past year, none in 2020, all since January 2021, since the inoculation started. Excess deaths are up 74,000 in the first five weeks of this year. Last year finished up 548,000. That's 16.7% for last year. Okay. Moderna stock is down 70%. Pfizer's down 20%. That, you know what that tells you? The fraud is starting to get around. Okay. The insurance sector just reported, all reporting a significant rise in mortality. Unum up 36%, Lincoln up 57%, Peru up 41%, all right? And now they're starting to offset their life insurance to the reinsurers, okay? Because they see what's happening, all right? Tom Rents, who spoke with Senator Ron Johnson's five-hour webcast, which I sent to you guys. I hope you, listen, I hope you watched it, all right? He spoke about the Defense Medical Database. Mis miscarriages are up 300% over the last five-year average. Cancer up 300% over the same period. Neurological issues up 1,000%. After all of this, all of it, what did we hear from yesterday, Hochul? Oh, we need to get those vaccinations up for the students so we could take the masks off. Did you hear that? Did you hear any of that? So today, I donated money to Tom Rents. You know why? Because he promised to do whatever he has to do to hold people responsible and accountable. That's the Fauci's, the Walensky's, the CDC, the FDA, the AAP, the NIH, all of them. And as of now, this district is known for being pro-mandates, okay, and against parent choice. That's what everyone's saying. And from what I have seen, our district would be perfectly fine with mandating vaccinations thanks to Eve Creek. And for whatever reason, she fails to understand or ignore the data okay. of the science and the inconsistency. Mr. Ballastari, I quoted in Newsday. Hold on. Not... She's quoted in Newsday. She also does roundtable discussions. Okay. We are not. Warren. Hold on. No, a we are not going to talk about an individual member of the board. And if you continue. She does no. roundtable discussions. Excuse me. Do I need to have your microphone cut off? What? You please. I don't need the mic. Okay. We, well, Obviously, I don't need the mic. You can't do roundtable discussions. Okay, Mr. Ballastari. Influencing this nonsense. You understand me? I ask for your liability bonds from Gina. Once I get them, I will proclaim this for every one of you. Everyone! Jenny Zentner. Jenny Zentner. I wanted to just come back up. Um, Dr. Manning, you and I have been in conversations since about January last year. When I spoke to Dr. Manning on the phone, probably, because it wasn't an email, I said, I'm really concerned about the situation. I'm really concerned about the kids. I'm really concerned about the mass, about the impending vaccines coming down. And you said, you know, come to a board of ed meeting, but nobody goes to board of ed meetings, really. So you can see where we are now, because there's certainly a lot of people here tonight that really care about what's happening and are really concerned about our kids. And I don't talk about the vaccines very often because I understand that you guys don't have any control over that. Um, however, we're asking you to advocate. I am connected to almost every school district on Long Island and now almost through New York State, not just me, all parents, we are connected with one another because we are fighting these issues. Harbor Fields 
is one of the very few school districts that have not voiced a single opinion, nothing to New York State. Write and advocate for the students. Again, if you need more information and you want to reach out to me, I'm very accessible. Thank you so much again for your time. Thank you, Ms. Ethna. Kim Bykov. To the members of the Board of Education, thank you so much and thank you to the community. My name is Kim Bykov. I have a fifth grader at TJL. I want to just respect the fact that everyone, everyone in this room tonight is here because they are passionate. They're passionate about this community and the students. And I just want to thank the board, the members of the administration, and those in the community who have come out tonight to voice opinions on a very important issue. I also very much appreciate um, sharing any additional information that you have certainly are interested in any additional mitigation um, and information that the board would be able to provide to the extent that there's additional mitigation measures you may consider in the event that masks are no longer mandated. That information may include, of course, vaccination rates um, within our district staff and whether there are vaccinations for our students as well. We very much appreciate your commitment to all students in the district and I very much appreciate the opportunity to speak to you this evening. Thank you so much for your service and thanks again for having us. Thank you. Okay, now we're, thank you. Now we're going to move on to the um, board discussion. This is a discussion um, amongst the board if they so choose to participate. Um, we are going to be talking about the expiration of the mask mandate that was requested to be discussed at this meeting. Would anyone like to make a comment? Um, I, I think I would, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think I would like to make a comment. I think um, that I want to commend uh, the community for for coming out, I do appreciate everyone's opinion on both sides of all of these difficult issues. Um, I think the district has been pretty clear um, in the way they've outlined everything that's happened so far, and I fully support um, the way everything has gone down so far. Uh, should this mask mandate expire, I guess when uh, this mask mandate would expire, I would assume the same type of process, um, which would be that we would be um, considering no extra or more restrictive um, steps than what our reopening plan had or what the mandate then lifts. Um, and I think it's important for, um, for this conversation to be had. Thank you, sir. I'll make a comment if I can. Um, I just, before I make any comments about masks, um, Dr. Manning, I just want to make a few comments, especially um, tonight, listening to the, to the finance presentation and just working with Sharon. Uh, Sharon um, I'm very happy with the with the state that we're in. It's been amazing work to get us there. Um, the work you've done to um, onboard our new superintendents, assistant superintendents, our new admins um, has been amazing. The strategic planning work you're doing is amazing. Um, our capital improvement plans, uh, capital improvement plans, as we said before, uh, front page news in any other year. Um, I know you have an open door. I know you work tremendously hard contacting people who call you, who email you. I know I've been on your late night uh, uh, key communicator meetings. I've seen the outreach to the community and I really, really appreciate the incredible work you're doing there. And uh, I really appreciate the staff, the support you're giving our staff and our students. Um, I could go on. I mean, the list, the list is tremendous. We're having uh, just about uh, an incredible year, but I know 
this pandemic has, has given us tremendous challenges. Um, I, I, I'm expecting this governor to lift this mandate. And um, as Sue said, I don't, I don't want our district to be any more restrictive than, uh, than what the New York state mandates. Um, I do have a question maybe about, you know, when this happens, which I, I think it will be soon. I, I wish the governor would give us more clarity. I know that you've asked legislators for more clarity. Uh, you know, uh, one of my questions is, um, do you, have you received clarity? I mean, is the clarity you get from the governor the same as what we read in the news or do superintendents get uh, extra clarity or you just uh, hear and see the news? Uh, so unfortunately, uh, no, we find out the same time as, as the general public. Um, the conversations that we've had through the superintendent's association and, and there's the Suffolk County Com Superintendent Association, New York State Super Superintendent Association, all advocated for the same thing, which is, uh, for that clarity, both in metrics and also communicating in advance so that we can properly plan and properly communicate to our families mm -hmm. to avoid uh, some of the confusion that was even referenced tonight. Um, that's obviously the least, that's the last thing we want to do is create confusion. But um, I have to say that, you know, we are finding out at the same time yeah. as everybody else. Speaking of planning, um, I think we're planning for a mask optional environment. Um, can you talk a little bit about, you know, what, what will change? I mean, what will change in terms of quarantining, spacing, things like that? Is that, is that still, can you add any clarity to that? So that's some of the clarity that we're looking for. If the mask mandate goes away and we're mask optional, um, obviously one of the concerns you would have is that, um, you know, with, with masks being on, the quarantine circle is three feet and that would extend to six feet without masks. So we would anticipate uh, either some changes to that, this quarantine rules, or, you know, we, we would have uh, unfortunately more students quarantined. The idea that the cases are dropping, hopefully have less incidents and there would be less reasons to quarantine, but, um, you know, the alternatives to that, we are spaced out at our max that we can handle with having all students in school. Uh, and we would not be looking to move to any type of hybrid environment or anything like that. We wanna keep all students in school all the time. So, um, you know, that is gonna be one of the challenges that we'll face, but we, and I have to again, thank our administrators. We feel we're up for the challenge and we're ready for that. Right. The, um, I'm sorry, if I, I'm gonna have a list here. <laughs> um, you know, having kids in school, I think we've done an amazing job of keeping the kids in school. I know, you know, we had, uh, it feels like, it feels like years and years ago, we did the, uh, you know, when we went uh, fully online and then we, you know, we got back in hybrid, yeah. but, but uh, I know our doors have been open and I know we're fighting, you know, we were fighting very, very extremely high numbers, uh, um, which mirrored, I, I think it was it mirrored the, uh, the community, but it was less than the community, but, right. but still, extremely high numbers, I'm happy to see them go way down. Um, one, one thing I wanna, uh, you know, I, I work in New York City. I know, you know, the governor's lifted mask mandates in public places. Uh, you know, I happened to be on the train yesterday and, uh, you know, masks were mandated. And uh, I understand that that's a federal mandate and mm -hmm. that also will apply to buses. Um, has there been any word on, on that front? No, nothing, nothing changing on that front. Uh, so masks are mandated by different regulation. Uh, and unless that changes, they would still be required on buses. Okay. That's not a state mandate. And no, no communication from, from federal. No. Nope. Yeah. Okay. Um, and there's no, you have no, we have no date right now, right? Is that, it's still, um, still TBD from the um, governor, right? On the buses? Uh, no, uh, I'm sorry. I've switched back to just the governor. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, my understanding is the 21st um, is that announcement you heard in the public. She's made comments about, I think his reference was re referenced by a, a commentator tonight, uh, you know, the week after the break, just to analyze the numbers, but hopefully no more uh, in advance so we can plan and communicate accordingly. And just one last question, just to uh, that last public speaker. Um, interesting sort of, um, you know, some members who who will still be masked even after um, 
after the mandates are lifted, uh, who prefer masks, but you know, to know, and, and I know we publish in our in the newspaper, our, um, well, we're publishing COVID rates. I, don't, I think we publish county vaccination rates too, but you don't have student, you don't know our student vaccination rates, no. right? That's not something we would publish. No. I don't even think you have it, right? No, we don't have it. Okay. Um, I think that's it for me, right? Thank you. Oh, there we go. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I understand the community's frustration and, um, you know, we, we want these masks to come off. I understand that. I've been wearing an N95 for the last two years at work every single day, all day, and no one wants the masks to come up more than I do, trust me. Um, and I know we want to see our, our children smiling faces, you know, when they're at school all day. Um, you know, but I think that our primary responsibility as um, a district is to keep our children safe when they're inside our schools. Right. So. Um, okay. Okay. Listen, I would appreciate it if we could allow each person to speak. That's actually, excuse me, Mr. Coleman, you may or may not be aware, but a, a board of education meeting is for the purpose of the board to convene and discuss. It is not a community forum. That's where the distinction is. This is not a community. No, we are having a, a regular board of education meeting and the board is discussing this matter. I would ask, excuse me, I would ask, I would ask for the courtesy to allow each board member to be able to speak. Thank you. So our primary responsibility should be to keep our children safe while they're inside schools and we also want a goal of, of keeping our children in school, right? And, and be with their friends and learning and be in that supportive environment. And uh, we know that school districts that don't have a uh, mask requirements are 3.5 times more likely to have outbreaks, which will you know, increase the children in experts. And you know, this is what these people do, right? They study epidemiology and the transmissibility of the virus. And you know, they weigh that with the, the vaccination rates. And um, you know, they're gonna take all that into account and, and decide if it's safe for our children to be inside schools without masks when, when we know that um, you know, without that mitigation factor, they'll be more vulnerable. So that's what they're really gonna be deciding, you know, and, and advising her on. And, um, and we're hopeful, you know, a lot of the public health experts that we hear from say the consistent positivity rates less than 5%, um, you know, given, um, you know, those low rates and some vaccination rates in the community should, um, should make it um, more safe for the children to be able to remove the mask. But, you know, I, I would personally wait for them to weigh in. And I think that's what the governor is doing. Um, but, you know, I, I just think it's important to wait for that because um, you know, we, we want that information because we need to protect the children because children do get sick from COVID. Contrary to what's been stated here, meeting after meeting, um, children do get sick from COVID, okay? Um, excuse me, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, um, right. So, so a couple of months ago during one of these meetings, we had a community member say the children weren't being hospitalized for COVID. And that very night, my husband, who's a pediatric emergency room physician at Cohen Children's Hospital, was resuscitating an 11-year-old boy with no prior medical condition whatsoever, who had MISC, multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, who um, required cardiac support and respiratory support um, in, the in the ICU. And um, in the month of January, they had 14 children um, with that condition um, that, that needed to be in the ICU. And that, that's, a staggering, that's a staggering number to have the same. Um, the, majority, the majority of the children, I mean, this is not a back and forth, but the majority of the children that have been hospitalized with MIC and across the country um, during the last wave were not vaccinated, no. So um, to go on, in addition to the, the dozens of children that they've had to resuscitate because of MAIC in the course of the pandemic, many of whom have no underlying illness whatsoever, um, there have been 1,238 deaths in children from the pandemic. All right, and that number is staggering to any pediatrician who hears that number. No, that, that's not false, sir. So 1,238 children, according to the CDC, have died from COVID. Okay. Yes, oh. yes, yes. And, um, you know, that represents 0.01%, right, of, of all infections, and that number might not seem very high, but I would imagine that, that 
every parent of those 1,238 children um, really don't care about statistics, right? Um, so, you know, that, that's not a number that we've seen in, in my years of practice or in recent history um, in this country of, of children dying from infectious diseases. That's just not something that we, we see in this country, all right? And um, we need to do everything we can to prevent that from happening. Um, you know, in addition to the deaths, um, you know, we've had tens of thousands of children require hospitalization for COVID during the course of the pandemic. Um, 6,500 children have developed that multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children that affects every organ in their body that invariably leads to ICU admission and um, is, is a very, very serious condition. One in seven children develop long COVID symptoms, suffering cardiac and respiratory symptoms, you know, for months after their diagnosis, neurological symptoms. Um, and we, a recent study found that, you know, children who've had COVID infection are um, at increased risk for developing diabetes. There's just so much we don't know about um, the, we know a lot about the short and long-term effects of COVID, but there's so much that we don't know. And that's what concerned us as pediatricians. So, um, you know, again, I'm really heartened that the numbers are coming down and I do hope that the mask can safely come off soon, but I think we have to wait for the public health experts to understand um, whether the, the you know, the 78.3% vaccination rate in the entire population of Suffolk County will provide enough of a cushion uh, along with those low positivity rates to, to protect the children that are unvaccinated because 22% of 5 to 11 year olds have been vaccinated and 60% of 12 to 17 year olds. So um, they're, they're not protected at this time. But you know, the, the vaccination rates of the, of the rest of the population, low positivity rates might make it it's safe enough for the the mask to come off. But you know, the, again, that's, those are decisions that should be guided by the experts in, in that field. And I would just say moving forward, um, you know, as, as we move on and, and the expected you know, removal of masks or when masks become optional, that we just approach the situation as a community and as a district with grace and, and compassion and understanding because there will be some children in school that will need to wear masks because they are immunocompromised, um, because they have a family member that's immunocompromised, that they, they've lost a family member, you know, that they're gonna wanna wear masks and um, they'll need to protect themselves. And I'm a little concerned because we're gonna have, you know, young children who might be at risk, whose parents want them to wear masks in school who are gonna be left to their own, um, you know, we shouldn't leave it up to a seven-year-old to be responsible for their own health, right? And we can't really have teachers policing in the classrooms, um, you know, that these children wear their masks when they really need to for their own health. And, and it concerns me that middle schoolers and high schoolers who might want to wear masks either because they want to protect their health or because they need to protect their health and, their, and their health of their families, um, that they'll feel peer pressure if other children aren't wearing masks and they might not wear it when they really need to for their health and to protect their family. So, I just hope that we can create a culture, you know, where where you know mask wearing is, um, you know, is understood and 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 treated as something that we're doing to protect each other and, and the children understanding that some children need to wear masks and um, you know wearing them if they're tolerated and um, you know just just to really be, truly be a Harborfields family and 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 come together and um, and support each other. So again, my 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 point's just being. Um, listen to the experts in public health to protect our children from COVID, which can be very serious in children, and, and support the, the vulnerable members of our community who, um, who will need to continue masking. Well, first of all, I think the thing that people have to keep in mind is that we are all one of seven. So we come together and, you know, we just, we have discussions and then we come out and we try to present one voice, um, but sometimes that's not what we want to do. We would love to have an open dialogue. It's just not, that's not the way board meetings work. Um, I, for one, cannot wait for the masks to come off, but I respect every one of the people up here who have whatever opinion they have, because we're all coming from different perspectives. We really are, you know, I, I can't speak, I, you know, if I was in an ER room seeing deaths and sickness every day, I might feel differently if, you know, there's just all different situations. So um, I, I, for one, am looking forward to the mandate being lifted. I hope it is lifted and I hope there is choice and I really do help 
the same thing that everybody respects each other's decision whether to or to not wear them if they come off. Thank you, Colin. First, I would like to um, apologize for um, the recess adjournment mess up. I candidly admit that this was my first experience with that kind of thing. And so I messed up. I apologize um, to anyone out there that was confused because um, we did not have the motion that carried. So um, like I said, that was my first um, experience with it. I just wanna say that my heart really hurts. Um, I feel very sad for how um, polarized our community has become over the last two years. And this is nothing that anyone would want to be going through. I wish we could rewind and that it was 2019. I have a daughter that was class of 2020. Um, and her, her, this is me personally as the mom, what she has suffered going through um, a COVID college experience has been very, very painful and she cannot get that time back. And, and a lot of times she just kind of only as a sophomore can't wait for college to be over because it just wasn't what she had expected nor, nor us. So I personally completely understand every person, every child who feels upset by what, what they're experiencing for their family. What I do know, whether people agree with it or not, we do have mandates that we have to comply with, but it does not mean that we are not advocating. At the legislative breakfast that we had, we discussed having metrics, real realistic metrics, better communication. The Superintendents Association did send a, le a letter to the governor asking for those metrics. We specifically asked about the vaccine mandates and we were told there is no legislation pending regarding the vaccination um, mandates and that is not expected to take place for this entire school year. Again, we are not the public health experts and we have no control if New York State does decide to make a vaccination, whether that's next year or the year after or the year after that. I completely personally understand vaccine hesitancy, 100%. So I really hope that it's not going to come to those kinds of forced decisions and that everyone in the community can feel comfortable with their choice. I hope that the, um, the governor will put down a concrete date soon, again, with realistic metrics. I hope that it's gonna take place shortly after the break. Um, you know, if there are spikes, I guess they'll have to address that at that time. But I look forward to being able to have that mask choice for our families when the mandate expires. With that, I would like to make a motion for real to adjourn. For real, so moved. Second. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, everybody.